but essentially um, this is the teaching talk. So I'm going to talk about um, the neurological assessment and to some extent the management of, of traumatic brain injury. So I, I'm a neurologist and I run a weekly multidisciplinary um, neurology clinic. Um, so I'm going to talk. I'm going to use that as the as the starting point, really, for the um, uh, the talk, and to talk through, I suppose, the process that we go through with each of the patients who comes into clinic. Um, so this will include a discussion of how patients present to us in clinic, um, a discussion of what the mechanism of injury was and the relevance of that, um, some discussion of how severe the injury was, how we might measure that, and how we classify injuries, um, a discussion of cognitive and neuropsychiatric problems, and then ending with um, a brief discussion of, of, of the question about whether there's progressive disease um, in addition to the immediate uh, effects of the traumatic brain injury. Um, so this is work actually that Gus, as uh, uh, Zimmerman in my group, has, has done. Um, uh, and this was really an audit of about 200 of the patients who came through clinic. And um, so what this shows is um, are the symptoms that people are complaining of when they come in. Um, essentially, we've asked a series of, um, uh, of standardized questions to patients coming through clinic as a way of quantifying where the areas of problems are. Um, so the first large area uh, of problems that we tend to see in our clinic is a, around cognitive difficulties. Um, and what you can see here is uh, different domains or different areas of cognitive difficulty. Um, uh, and then the, the percentage on the left of those difficulties. And, and you can see that, that there's very high percentages of patients that are having um, a range of difficulties. And they're particularly um, in areas of information processing speed, um, attention, various as aspects of memory, um, executive function. So the things we heard initially from uh, Vicky about uh, in the first talk, um, we're seeing a, a lot in the clinic. And I should say that these are patients who've often had their injuries many months, sometimes years previously. So these are persistent problems um, of cognitive function that are present in a very high percentage of our patients. Um, now, we also see a lot of psychiatric problems. So patients often have a constellation of um, uh, psychiatric and cognitive difficulties, particularly depression um, and anxiety. So those are the two biggest um, areas of, uh, of psychiatric difficulty. And then we have a range of other what we call kind of more medical um, neurological problems like headaches, dizziness and sleep disturbance and fatigue. And these are very, very common as well. So we have this really quite complicated um, set of symptoms that people are complaining of. And part of the job of the, of the neurologist really is to try and unpick um, what the causation of these symptoms are and then to work out um, what the correct management might be. Um, so another point to make on this slide is that we split the um, patients into those with moderate severe injuries. So I would say definite brain injuries. Um, and non-moderate severe injuries. So injuries where we're not sure, there's definitely been a head injury, but we're not sure whether there's been a brain injury. Um, and certainly in the context of our clinic, what we see is um, a lot of symptomatology in both groups. So there isn't a clear relationship between the uh, between a simple measure of the severity and, uh, and the presence or absence of these symptoms. And certainly for some things we see Great symptoms in the in the less severe group, which is obviously raising questions that uh, um, of causation of it. Okay, so I think the first question that uh, that we ask in clinic is is what was the mechanism of the injury? Um, so the, the the things we see most commonly are road traffic accidents, and they may be road, you know, car occupants, but um, equally commonly um, vulnerable road users, so cyclists, um, motorcyclists, pedestrians. Then we see a lot of falls. Here's a guy falling off a ladder, I think. So if, you, if, you're, a, if you're a middle-aged or older age man, don't go up too many ladders because we see a lot of people falling off ladders who are in their 60s and 70s. Um, we see some sporting injuries and that's an increasing area of, uh, of concern. Here's a, an injury occurring from a, a head or at a corner. Uh, and then also assaults, not usually in the context of boxing, but uh, um, the impact of assaults, um, you know, particularly uh, punches and falls to the floor. Um, so there's a there's a range of, of mechanisms and the first question is kind of is 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 can we tell something about the biomechanics um, of those injuries because fundamentally we're looking at a biomechanical problem it's the the application of force at the time of the injury to the brain and and is that sufficient enough and in what way does that translate into injury um, and so if we consider the um, the different types of injury um, I just wanted to point out that these are very, very common causes of long-term disability. 
Um, so this is a, um, a very comprehensive um, list of disability adjusted life years from the Lancet and it's really putting across all different kinds of um, uh, health issues into context um, those ones that cause most disability and what we can see is um, quite strikingly is that road traffic injuries as a whole you know come in at number 10 so in between um, CAPD and major depressive disorder so in terms of causing long-term disability road traffic inj injuries but also if you look further down the list falls um, self-harm you know, these additional areas of trauma are, are causing massive amounts of long-term disability. Um, and we, we just to, to talk a little bit more about the mechanism, um, we've been looking into the, the mechanism by which um, particular kinds of impact um, relate to um, uh, injuries within the brain. This is work by Claire Baker within my group in association with Transport Research Laboratories. And what we've been able to do there is look at 5,000 collisions, 560 of which caused um, traumatic brain injury, and look at the biomechanics of those collisions. So we can measure things like um, the velocity and the change in velocity at the time of impact. And I'm not going to labour this too much, but essentially there's a, a clear relationship between um, uh, how at risk you so if you're a car occupant or a vulnerable road user like a cyclist or a pedestrian and then the risk of um, different kinds of brain injury at a particular speed so the delta v here can be viewed for pedestrians who are hit as the speed of the car really and what you can see is that if, if you're traveling at 30 miles an hour 48 kilometers an hour here you've got a, a relatively small risk of producing any of these kinds of uh, injury but that's very different for pedestrians as you might imagine and um, where the risk say of skull fracture of, of 48 miles an hour goes up to almost 40 percent um, so there's a, there's a clear relationship between the um, um, the type of injury and the mechanism of injury and the likelihood of producing um, brain injuries. So so when we're trying to judge injury severity, um, what metrics should we use? Well, the first one is is loss of consciousness. So we need to try and make a judgment about loss of consciousness. That's often done with the Glasgow Coma Scale score. Um, and, uh, uh, and often we're looking at a, a, a cutoff of, uh, say, less than less than 14 as being indicative of a significant injury. Um, from a practical perspective, I suggest it's a good idea to go back to the ambulance notes or the early emergency service um, records, um, because although um, uh, loss of consciousness is common, it's often obscured retrospectively by memory disturbance and also treatment effects. Um, so as soon as patients start to have drugs, particularly opiate medication, various things, um, that will affect recollection and it becomes much more difficult to um, to understand. But certainly the, the level of conscious level measured by Glasgow Coma Scale uh, and then an estimate of loss of conscious duration is, is important. Um, the second thing is, is post-traumatic amnesia. So this is the period of episodic memory impairment after an injury. So um, people almost never um, remember a significant injury. I mean, if a patient comes into clinic and says, well, I remember exactly uh, what happened when there was the impact on my head, then I, I, I assume that there isn't a major injury there. Um, but the, the length of post-traumatic amnesia is informative. Um, ideally, that should be quantified. So we should be encouraging our colleagues um, to quantify that on the, on the wards. We might use the West Moit Mead post-traumatic amnesia scale or or another measure but you know the important thing is to try and quantify whether there is memory disturbance um, it's prognostically useful and it retrospectively can be assessed you can ask patients to try and reconstruct what happened to them after the injury but again it's often hard to interpret because of the particularly because of the effects of um, of treatment as i've as i've mentioned and then of course we're interested in imaging um uh, so this the, 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 the kind of quantification of the injury can often be quite clear. These are CT scans um, that would have been done very soon after, after injury. And we can see a large extra dural hemorrhage there, uh, an acute on chronic subdural. Um, this is a, a patient with very severe frontal hemorrhagic contusions who ended up having a decompressive craniectomy. And here's a depressed skull fracture. All of these are pretty um, obvious on, um, on CT imaging, which will be the mainstay of neurosurgical management early on. Um, so all of these um, situations would require neurosurgical um, intervention, often very, very rapidly, which is the key to um, preserving um, uh, brain health and, um, and improving functions long term. Um, now, MRI can be extremely useful in quantifying a, a range of, of injuries, and particularly, I would say, around the degree of white matter injury. 
Um, so we've heard a bit already about um, diffuse axonal injury, which I'll come on to. Um, but both flare and um, here um, susceptibility weighted imaging, so SWI, is probably the gold standard now for looking at microbleeds. So these are small areas of hemorrhage, um, particularly around the um, the perforating veins, um, which often occur in this in this um, uh, parafarsine distribution. So they have a particular distribution that relates to the um, uh, pattern of forces on the brain. Um, so those kind of relatively standard MRI techniques can be very helpful in picking up um, subtle um, brain lesions. Um, so axonal injury, I mean, one of, the, one of the, the tricks here is to bear in mind that axonal injury is common um, and is a driver for poor outcomes, but sometimes can be missed um, using standard CT and, uh, and MRI imaging. Um, you'll get disruption to the axons, um, the inflammatory response around the axons that we've heard from David Lone about, uh, and then over time, um, the disruption of, uh, of axonal function uh, and gradual neurodegenerative um, uh, effects. Um, here we can see it within the corpus callosum, and then we can quantify this in various ways, both in terms of the effects on the structure of the white matter, but also the effects on the, the function of brain networks that support cognitive function and other, other brain functions. Um, and I think um, much of our work is focused on using um, diffusion tensor imaging. We heard a little bit about this before. Um, but essentially, I, I'd say that diffusion tensor imaging now is, is, is worked up to the point where we can use it as a diagnostic tool for um, uh, diffuse axonal injury. Um, here we can see um, uh, assessments in the blue in patients with TBI and in the red in controls um, within the splenium of the corpus callosum. So this is the back end of the corpus callosum. And what you see is that a very large um, number of patients will have abnormalities um, within the splenium. A low uh, fractional anisotropy here is related to um, uh, damage to that particular area. And Amy Jolly's recent paper on brain um, showed that 50% of our 100 patient sample with moderate to severe had evidence of diffusion abnormalities on axonal injury. And importantly, 30% um, of the patients who had otherwise normal MRI scans had diffusion abnormalities. So you'll miss quite a significant proportion of patients if you just rely on other um, MRI changes. Um, what about blood tests? Neil's told you about um, uh, some of the blood tests. I think blood tests are coming um, or have already arrived in various uh, parts of the world. And so, so S100B is used now, UCHL1, I think neurofilament light and tau um, are all informative when taken at various points after injury. And Henrik Zetterberg and colleagues um, have really driven and um, uh, developed this area enormously over the last few years. So, what about classification? So I'd recommend that we try and classify patients um, uh, using, uh, we use the, the, the Mayo criteria, which splits patients into moderate, severe, definite injury, mild, probable injuries, symptomatic, possible injuries. And that's done on the basis of the presence of loss of consciousness, PTA, GCS, but also importantly, incorporates imaging. So if you have imaging abnormalities, um, then you would be, um, almost always put up into a moderate severe group, which seems appropriate to me. And then it also splits the mild group into a mild probable group. Um, and then a, a, another group where all we have really is symptoms. And I think it's probably quite important to separate that group where it's just symptoms from the, um, the more severe injuries, because um, I think it's much less clear often what the cause of the, of the, the symptom only group are really, if you have no ob other objective measure of what's going on. Um, briefly, what about concussion? Um, concussion is sometimes used as a, as a separate um, entity, so as a diagnostic label. Um, I'd advise against that. So I would say that we shouldn't be using concussion as a, as a diagnostic label, but concussion should really be reserved as a description of a constellation of symptoms that arise after head injury. Um, and our job is to work out where those symptoms are coming from. Are they coming from the brain? Are they coming from the, um, the ears or somewhere else? Okay, so what about one or two specific um, issues? So cognitive impairment. So as we've heard, that commonly affects processing speed, attention, memory, executive function. Um, one of the catches with assessing cognitive impairments is often we see problems with awareness. And early on that can be loss of consciousness, but later on we get a range of self-awareness issues um, that includes anosognosia, um, alexithymia, and vestibular agnosia. So my colleague Barry Seaman has really 
sort of um, uh, driven work in that area recently. But essentially, a whole range of um, of, of 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 kind of problems um, there can be a lack of self awareness for, uh, and that really complicates both the assessment and the management of these patients. Um, I think, from a practical point of view, we need to have um, uh, formal neuropsychological or objective testing of cognitive function in all of our patients um, because there's actually a very poor correlation between the symptoms that they report and objective deficits on uh, on cognitive screening tests. Um, I'd recommend always considering whether there's a personal injury claim um, that can affect um, aspects of cognitive assessment but importantly it does have a long-term um, effect on outcomes um, for a range of reasons. And then in terms of treatment um, Cognitive rehabilitation and vocational rehabilitation, I think, are at the mainstay of the of the treatment of these long term cognitive disabilities. Um, I think managing related problems, depression, anxiety, sleep, adverse drug effects are very, very important. And then in terms of drug treatments, I think we do have treatments that are effective. We don't use them very widely in the UK. They use more widely elsewhere. But I think our work in using in methylphenidate and those of an, uh, quite a lot of other studies showed effects on processing speed, to some extent attention, and also on fatigue and apathy, which can be very beneficial. Um, and also there's evidence that amantadine as another um, drug can uh, have a good effect on cognitive outcomes when given early post-traumatic brain injury. Um, in terms of psychiatric problems, I think we need to um, concentrate on psychiatric problems. Um, anxiety, depression, agitation, and aggression are very common. PTSD less so um, uh, when there's no memory of the event at least. And also consider the presence of functional disorders, which I think are relatively common in this, this group and need, uh, um, need to be addressed. I think associated um, factors such as a prior history of mental health um, need to be appreciated because they definitely worsen outcomes. Um, and we need a, a formal neuro that should be neuropsychiatric actually, a formal neuropsychiatric input. And we, we operate within the context of an MDT that has um, psychiatry input and neuropsychology input, which is extremely helpful. Um, cognitive behavioral therapies can be helpful and um, uh, drug treatments. Um, the, our first line is citalopram and sertraline. We use metazapine the sleep problems, and then sometimes risperidone and or quetiapine um, uh, for aggression, um, although these drugs are not particularly effective post-traumatic brain injury. Now, I realize I'm pretty much out of time, but uh, um, I just wanted to just finish by saying something about progressive disease. So I think as neurologists, we need to consider um, whether there is a progressive process. We've, we've heard a lot from David about um, the progression of neurodegeneration um, that can be triggered by TBI. And in, the, in a clinical context, we need to try and disentangle that. Um, certainly, de dementia pugilistica has been described for decades after repeated head injuries. Uh, but more recently, we've been focusing around chronic traumatic encephalopathy, particularly in the context of athletes and soldiers injured by repeated injuries. Um, and um, I think the challenge that we have at the moment is, uh, although it's clear um, that TBI can trigger um, a progressive neurodegenerative um, disease, I, I think the, the clinical phenotype of that is relatively unclear. Um, sometimes that can produce cognitive problems, progressive personality change, progressive psychiatric uh, di difficulties and suicide. But I, I think we need a fair bit more work at the moment um, using um, our methods that we've heard described really so molecular imaging pet imaging um mri and particularly repeated mri and measuring atrophy rates that would allow us to understand um the subset of patients who do have progressive neurodegenerative disease uh, and what the clinical manifestations of those diseases are um so i will just wrap up that um and summarize to really emphasize that traumatic brain injury i think is a is a leading worldwide cause of death and disability um, and that's particularly in the case of um, young people, adolescents and young um, adults. Um, I think it's our job to try and understand the grading of injury severity. And we can use that using a combination of Glasgow Coma Scale, loss of consciousness, post-traumatic amnesia and neuroimaging. Um, I'd emphasize the need to consider diffuse external injury as an important um, clinical manifestation that needs kind of separate diagnosis. Um, and then to really focus on cognitive and psychiatric impairments um, as uh, two of the, the big drivers of poor outcomes um, in the long term. 
um, and then to consider the possibility of post-traumatic neurodegenerative disease. Um, uh, and um, I think in many ways to approach um, patients with chronic disability, particularly those who are deteriorating in the long term, in a way that you might approach patients with um, other neurodegenerative diseases. So to, to begin to employ the same kind of assessments that we do for um, other um, types of uh, particularly early onset dementia. So I will stop that. Apologies for, for running over and then perhaps take one or two questions if there are any. So uh, Dave, there's some there from uh, Wendy Phillips. Would you consider ongoing symptoms post uncomplicated mild TBI to have a functional basis? Yeah, so I think that's a particularly um, uh, kind of interesting area at the moment. I, I think the functional neurologists um, would you know, feel that a lot of um, you know, these symptoms post mild TBI have a functional basis. I, I, I'm not, I, think that's, I think that's true for some of the, the patients. Um, I think it's really unclear how much of it has a functional basis. And uh, um, in a way, I think we need to kind of have, in a way, I, I think if we had more positive evidence of functional disease, for example, in, in the same way that we have for, say, motor problems with uh, various signs, that would help us differentiate, I think. And so it's, it's a pretty uncertain area, I think. And do you have time for another? If we, yeah. yeah, well then, um, um, Giovanni is asking, do imaging or fluid biomarkers provide greater prognostic power for functional outcomes than LOC or PTA duration? Um, a short answer, I think yes. Um, I think Neil's um, showing, I, I mean, we were very surprised at the, um, uh, at the prognostic value of, say, NFL early on. Um, NFL taken two to three weeks afterwards had a, you know, quite a good um, predictive value kind of late on. Um, so that seems to be, in some ways, a game changer. I mean, loss of consciousness early on is, is very confounded, and PTA often by treatment and by everything else that's going on. It can be really quite difficult to, um, uh, they're, they're, very, they're essentially very noisy measures early on, particularly in you know, more, severe, some more severe injuries. So in the end, we're going to need imaging plus blood biomarkers to be deployed to really disentangle this, I think. Yeah, 